you might have a few extra words to say, Marshall, but I guess what I'd like to do as the director of the Peter Harrison Centre for Disability Sport is just one thank the Institute of Balanced Studies for enabling us then to be a visiting fellow of the IAS over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, he was a fantastic postdoc here at Loughborough University uh, doing work translating the research findings that we had both from a sporting, from a sport perspective, all the way through to working with clinical links here at, um, in, in the UK. And particularly before Sven left, he forged some really exciting relationships with Sheffield Spinal Injury Units. And what I'd like to do actually is, uh, first of all, just sort of thank Sven for keeping in contact with us, which has been made possible through this IAS fellowship, but also um, just for those people in the room and maybe who see this um, recording, is thank Sven for being proactive because Sven was passing through the UK and he felt that he'd like to come to Loughborough and actually share some of his research that he's now doing in Texas, in the States, around the area of uh, research with personal spinal injury with another, another research group. And we, I do see in the array that we've got people from sort of creative design, School of the Arts, and School of Sport and Health and Exercise Scientists. And actually, he did leave a little bit of a legacy um, here at Loughborough, a hard gap to fill. But one of our projects that we were doing in Sven's absence whilst he was in Texas has actually just recently won an award. And uh, we were awarded um, best poster for a uh, systematic review at the Maskit conference just a couple of weeks ago where Natasha, who's in the audience, represented the poster with one of our clinical partners from Shepherd Spark Injury Unit. So I'd like to actually thank Sven for keeping uh, in loop with that research, um, which also involved James King, who's here today as well. But I will pass the floor to Sven because I apologize that I've never learned to pronounce his surname. Um, but I just provide a warm welcome to join us today. If I could just stop, st step in for one moment and welcome everyone to the IAS. Um, uh, ordinarily, I pass over to Vicky, but obviously I'm not able to be there. So this would be, so this is um, uh, taken us by surprise. I only want to say, very much welcome. And again, thank you so much, uh, Sven, uh, to Sven Hoekstra, who is coming to us um, uh, on this occasion from San Antonio, but who is who has a long relationship with Loughborough um, and obviously a very um, a, a established international set of collaborations, but also to Vicky Tolfrey, who is our colleague, um, who has had a long relationship with the IAS and has hosted a number of fellows over a period of time not least on this particular area of spinal cord injury research, which is just absolutely leading um, in the world around Vicky and her collaborators. And so we are delighted to be able to host that. One thing I would like to say to all those colleagues who are joining us online is that you are in a webinar format, but you will be able to um, feed in because we do monitor the webinar um, chat and the Q&A. So if you have a, Q &A, a question, or a comment to make, please do use the Q&A and the chat, and we will make sure that Sven has that information fed in um, to the discussion. And in addition, we do not keep the chat or the Q&A, although we record the talk. So that means we don't have any GDPR issues, and you are very welcome to feed in um, and not anticipate that that will then end up online in our video library, along with the podcast of the talk. So very much welcome today from the IAS. Thank you, Vicky, so much for a great introduction. And over to you, Sven, for what will be, I'm sure, a most enjoyable seminar. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, and yeah, nice to be here, nice to be here in such a, an intimate uh, atmosphere. Um, and then also kind of like you think like throughout the presentation, probably best to just chip in if you've got a question on the slide rather than wait all the way to the end because it's uh, it's gonna be very lengthy, lengthy thing. Um yeah, so as it says there, I'm, I'm currently a postdoc uh, at UT Health in San Antonio, um, which is which is Kind of a combined institute where I'm officially linked to UT Health, which is a medical school. It's got a, like a hospital attached to from a medical school. 
but then most of the work actually takes place in the Patron and Pass Hospital, which is just across the road and it's connected, connected with, a, with a bridge. Um, and as you expect, that is very much focused on veterans, um, and veterans only have access to, to healthcare, and also the research is on is on veterans. So that makes for a lot of interesting stories, um, and also uh, yeah, so the population of course to do research. Yes. Um, and the people I work with, I'm only just just for a bit of background is. Um, Mainly uh, Michelle Turkic, who is MD, but also uh, social professor at the same time. So she kind of balances both clinical uh, and academic work. And that's the same for Lee Gallup, whose background is more around uh, microvascular function and uh, skin blood flow, as you guys will all know. Um, and then on the right uh, is uh, Marcus Lay, who is in the diabetes division, where we work more on glucose metabolism and uh, metabolic health uh, in the spine. So I'll um, today we'll discuss a bit of that work, also some uh, older things and current things we're doing at, at LACRA, and it's both stuff that we've done, but also plans for the future and projects that we've got lined up. Um, so I would very much invite you to come on that as well. And in general, it's kind of divided into two sections. So part of the work has been on uh, the effects of spinal cord injury, so how does that impact on physiology and metabolism, and trying to understand the injury and the facts of it. Um, and then at the same time, we're looking at interventions really targeted and specific for that population and that are accessible for, for most of the, the members of the population. And yeah, so as some of you might be aware, and that, that's nothing new here, is that spinal cord injury uh, is associated with deteriorated metabolic health. Um, and that might be um, caused partly by lifestyle factors that impact us as well, like physical inactivity. Uh, diet is exacerbated by being in a wheelchair for most of its members, so it's very low daily energy expenditure. But at the same time, there's also SCI-specific factors uh, like autonomic dysfunction and the large reduction in, in muscle mass uh, that people have, especially people have been using that. And in that respect, yeah, we're mostly interested in that metabolic syndrome and, and uh, the, the factors and markers associated with that. And although I said it's, it's a very well-known concept that, that metabolic health is deteriorated in this population, there's very little sort of longitudinal data. So people who are just, um, for example, done with an uh, inpatient rehabilitation and go out in the community, that trajectory is not quite uh, very well understood. And also the impact of, of the lesion level uh, is, is still unclear. Um, so just briefly that you can have a cervical uh, lesion which impacts um, you know, the majority of physical function and metabolic processes and then you have a lower le lesion uh, it's a and uh, then more metabolic process are impact um, and in this study what we've done um, so the pattern of our system they keep track of, of all the clinical uh, work that's been done. So they have a database, a large database of people that are tracked over time. So they come in yearly for, for the test where then a blood sample is taken, the body mass is taken, and then just as general measures are obtained. And here we included, yeah, just over 700 people, uh, divided them into people with paraplegia as well as tetraplegia, and then they were tracked up to 21 years. Uh, and some of them, of course, weren't tracked all the way. But the, the total follow up time was, was just over 20 years. Um, and these lines there represent the, the different lesion level of groups. Um, so, as you can see, and as, as, as they are stated on the top as well, there's, in general, there's a higher prevalence and also incidence of, of diabetes over time. Um, so, the prevalence at, at baseline when people are admitted is yeah, just over twice as much as you would expect in the general population. And similar figures too for the incidence of time. Um, but then when you look more closely at these lesion levels, although there's a slight divergence kind of midway, overall there doesn't seem to be too much of an impact uh, on, on diabetes risk between both uh, population groups. Um, and that might have something to do with the higher BMI that we saw in the group with paraplegia, who you would expect to be at a low risk for diabetes, but maybe the, the Slightly less representation body composition as we find uh, balanced it out. Our 
when, when we look at uh, mortality uh, data, so in this graph you see again red is tetraplegia, blue is paraplegia, but then they divide it into those that get diabetes and those that don't during the follow up. Um, and we can look at the effect of getting diabetes on mortality. Um, and then, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, it doesn't seem to be a strong effect of, of getting diabetes on, on mortality, um, probably because there are still in this population other factors like infection, um, vascular um, issues that might be more important in terms of mortality than, than diabetes, at least in this color. So, I, what, what's this flat line at the very end for diabetes for both diabetes and diabetes? Just yes. Um, yeah, that's where it's, so what you see on the y-axis is the percentage of survivors of the people who remain alive. Yeah? Um, and the x-axis is, is the years. So that's the flat line um, means that that number yeah, stays the same in terms of people who die uh, during that follow-up. I can understand that, but what, why? You know, like in, in all the other years, it's kind of a steady decline at the long time state. I think one aspect, yeah, that's true. One aspect of right is the lower number of people that are still followed up at that point. So you, we start with, yeah, you see like seven months, yeah. something at oh, right, the yeah. start, and then later there's only a handful of people that we follow. And so uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's how I <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but one thing, despite that, there's so there's no strong effect of diabetes, but what you do also see in this graph is that um, tetraplegia has a higher risk of mortality, higher rate of mortality than viral feature. and um, yeah, that is also well known, especially at the the start uh, after spinal cord injury, but very also uh, later on with follow up and the test piece of course on the hydrogen side. Um, but then, yeah, despite the maybe limited effect of diabetes or mortality, um, we still want to, like it still uh, comes with a lot of other comorbidities, diabetes, so it's still a, an area of concern in this population. Um, so we decided to look more closely into glucose and metabolism more from a lab-based perspective. Um, and other people have done that before. So this is uh, from a group in Birmingham in the US where they done an OGPT in people with a high lesion level and people with a lower lesion level. This is uh, females. And you see that despite similar fasting glucose, peptide, insulin compared to an able body group, the post value responses are more negative, or um, so glucose tolerance is deteriorated in people with spinal cord injury, and especially in those with a higher lesion level. As you can see in this graph, so there's a, a large excursion of glucose in response to a, a sweet glucose gene. And what is important here is that these effects, they, they were maintained after correcting for uh, fat mass uh, and other sort of known factors that impact glucose tolerance. Um, so there seems to be, as I mentioned before, other factors that are related to spinal cord injury than just uh, fat mass or other body conditions and uh, lifestyle factors. Um, and there was another study, this is a, an old study from the 80s, where again they showed a deteriorated glucose tolerance in people with spinal cord injury. And here, I like to focus on the, the bottom two lines in the left, left graph, because the, the top line is people with diabetes, and we expect that, uh, that these people have a deteriorated glucose tolerance. But even with people with normal, let's say, fasting levels of, of glucose intensity peptide, we see a, a, a worse glucose tolerance in SCI. And what's interesting now is that if you look at the table on the right, um, that insulin sensitivity for the glucose disposal is not necessarily uh, different in, in between those groups. So, although that's, that, that has been reported differently in other studies, but it does suggest that maybe insulin sensitivity, so the uptake from, uh, from the muscle and the liquid, but in this case, the muscle, is, is maybe not the only factor that plays a role in this glucose tolerance in SCI. 
So it might also be on the side of either insulin clearance or insulin secretion. So in our study, um, yeah, that's what we decided to look a bit more closer uh, at. And one part, if you look at insulin secretion, that is that's an important concept, uh, is this incretin effect. And an incretin effect is basically the difference in insulin response between glucose ingested orally, so uh, a, a glucose drink or a mixed meal, uh, whatever food you consume, and then the glucose that is matched, so the same amount of glucose, but uh, intravenously uh, uh, provided. And as you can see there in the right top figure, is that if you ingest glucose orally, that insulin response is a lot larger compared to when you uh, uh, provide it intravenous. So that difference is the effect. Um, and that's mediated mainly by neural factors, but also gut hormones. Uh, so the well-known ones are GLP-1 and DIP. So they stimulate uh, that insulin secretion response to the cookie. And because we know that uh, the lesion, the spinal lesion, affects yeah, a lot of tissue below that lesion, right? The metabolic tissue, the liver, the, the gut. Um, we might expect, or it, it, yeah, it's worthwhile to investigate whether this incredible response or just in general the insulin secretion response to feeding is also impacted by, by spinal lesion. And there are some suggestions from uh, animal data, for example, that, that indicate that maybe these gut hormones work a little bit differently after spinal cord injury. Um, and I've made this very preliminary data, but uh, here they um, induced spinal cord injury in uh, mice, it was. And then they again, they, they did this oral glucose tolerance test, so they, they looked at postprandial uh, responses in, in these mice. And the main figure to look at here is the top left figure, where you see on the left is the sham mice. So there was no, well, they have sham surgery, so in a way they have healthy control mice. Uh, and then on the right, there's the mice with spinal cord injury. And um, it's fast as first bet, so before and after the, the glucose challenge. And you see that in the, the healthy control mice, let's say the, the GLP-1 response to that feeding is. is very modest. Whilst on the right side, you see a large deal of one response to that same glucose challenge in the people with spinal cord, but the mice with spinal cord. Um, and then at the same time, that comes with a, a smaller autonomic nervous system activation for which CCK is a, is a, is a marker. Um, and it comes with a, a worse glucose tolerance, as you can see in the bottom figure. So there seems to be actually, and which is sounds intuitive if you feel that insulin secretion is, is impaired, but there seems to be an enhanced GLP-1 secretion uh, in response to feeding, at least in this, in this particular study. Um, and we found, again, very small numbers and, and preliminary and not very uh, clear, but we found a suggestion in our study as well, which was done by Jordan Fenton, uh, where there was a a trend for a larger DLP1 response to, to feeding, in this case, mixed meal, um, like a drink, in the SCI group versus the able body control group. So, this suggests that that be reported for older adults, and it's very early days, but it might be that maybe the effect of DLP1 on the pancreas and on insulin secretion is affected by the body. But that's Something to determine later. In, in this study, we really want to take a step back and just look at insulin secretion and indices of insulin secretion uh, if you put spinal cord injury compared to a control uh, non insulin secretion. So we just, yeah, we have 13 people with spinal cord injury, 10 able body controls, and they underwent a three hour mixed meal tolerance test, uh, which is a fairly standard test. And then apart from the graphs that you normally see, so glucose, um, C peptide, and insulin. Uh, we actually managed to get insulin secretion rates from uh, collaborators in, in Italy. Um, and we, using those, we could come up with indices for insulin secretion. Um, so, one of the, or some of the main ones are these two so, disposition index and the beta cell glucose sensitivity. And the disposition index is basically the 
insulin secretion, so the total insulin secretion over that period of the test, and then adjusted for the insulin sensitivity. And as you can see there, that, that, that was a big difference there between the SCI group and able bodies. And a similar trend was, uh, was apparent for that body cell glucose sensitivity. Um, and that glucose sensitivity is basically the rate of insulin secretion as a factor of, of glucose concentration. So it tells something about how sensitive the pancreas responds to, to, uh, to that uh, excursion glucose. And we found similar findings for insulin clearance. Um, so this is basically how much um, insulin the liver is taken up by the liver before it's um, presented to the people of the muscle and the kidneys. Um, here again is the reduction in the SCI group. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned in that first study, it was kind of uh, generally uh, accepted is that also insulin sensitivity is, is reduced. Uh, likely related to the reduction in the muscle mass. So then we, yeah, we, we know that insulin sensitivity is impacted maybe also insulin secretion. So in general, there's, there's a higher risk for, for diabetes in this population. Um, and then, yeah, what we want to do about it is, is the next step. Um, and that's where we've done, uh, yeah, Vicky mentioned already, we've done a lot of work with uh, James King as, as lab is. Um, where we, well, first of all, done a systematic review into weight management strategies in people with spinal cord injury. And it wasn't like the, the studies were too heterogeneous to, to really do a meta analysis, but we, we tried to do the, the second best thing, uh, collate, collate the numbers. And on average, these interventions uh, caused a 4% reduction in body mass. Um, and at the same time, just over a third. Of, of the people who completed those kind of interventions, um, they achieved a weight loss of more than 5%. Um, and I put 5% because it's generally kind of seen as a clinically meaningful change, where you have also changes in glucose metabolism markers and lipid markers, and they seem to come above that 5%. So, although 4% is not necessarily a, a bad number, but based on that, that second line, yeah, we might have to look into more effective strategies for really the whole population and that uh, both the uh, percentage I get out of but also the number of people really can benefit uh, from these kind of impact. And that's where maybe pharmaceutical options come in, um, although we know that, yeah, exercise and diet are kind of first choice, especially being here in the sports science department. Um, but yeah, we also got to be realistic, and, and these studies, at least in able-bodied individuals with and without diabetes, show very promising. Um, on average, around 15% um, loss in body weight. Um, so that might be worth exploring in this population as well. And there's going to be very limited knowledge, and there's reasons why we should study it in this population before just uh, Handing it out to other people and say, okay, it works in able bodied individuals, thus we can also try it in this context. Um, for example, one of the effects that this drug has is on gastric emptying, which is slowed down in general, and that is already slowed down in spinal cord injury. Um, so that might cause issues with uh, bowel management, which is something that could be studied in, in more detail. Um, but there's one group in, in, in the US actually that has had similar ideas, and then that is with a small group of, of people. As you see, on the NS3, so it's very uh, uh, early days. But they showed very limited side effects, and uh, that it at least suggested that it can be safely used also in people with spinal cord. Um, so now, led by James King, we're uh, exploring whether we can actually set this up a bit bigger and, and look into. Uh, Feasibility pilot testing in people with spinal cord injury. Um, I want to change, change gear a bit because we move to diabetes, but there's also vascular aspects uh, that are or that might be affected by, by spinal cord injury. Um, and we know that that's the case for blood pressure management, but it's a bit less known about uh, microvascular function, so skin blood flow. And as 
even if you will be aware of it, pressure illness is a is a big issue in the progress. Uh, it's probably the number one reason why people are readmitted to, to the hospital. And one I'm, I'm looking at uh, at Alex when I say this said it's okay, but one of the main reasons for a pressure ulcer to occur is, is ischemia, so the lack of oxygen supply to the, to the skin. And and that gets um threatened if you if pressure is applied to the skin. For example, if you sit down, if you lie down, over time that can cause a uh, pressure ulcer if you don't have uh, enough oxygen supply going to that uh, that tissue. So in, in non-injured able-bodied individuals, if you apply low pressure to the skin, there's actually an inherent sort of protective mechanism in place that, that uh, yeah, can prevent that, that uh, ischemia. And that, that concept is called pressure-induced vasodilation. And I think it's best seen that concept in the figure on the right. So if you look at the top line, so the x-axis is an increase in pressure. I'm not sure what device they, they used here, but they slowly increase the pressure. And on the y-axis, you see skin blood flow. You can see that there. Um, and you see that initial increase, this kind of protective mechanism to, to actually say, OK, the, the skin is in danger here. We need to increase blood flow to that side. And that's, that's yeah, that is repeated often in, in able-bodied uh, populations. But at the same time, you see in those graphs as well, that is affected by aging, uh, by sensory neuropathy, um, and also by diabetes. So all those populations have a, a lack or at least an impaired uh, PID. And that might be to do with uh, local inflammation or sensory function at that site. And, and they're all factors that are impacted by spinal cord injury as well, especially the tissue below the knee. That are at risk for, for pressure ulcers. Um, so, what we planning to do, what we plan to do over the next two years, is look at this more closely. So, you see this fantastic drawing here on the on the left of the device that uh, that they built. So it's basically a device that we touched it off. It's been there for thirty odd years. Um, we tested it a bit in yeah, well, the nineties, and then didn't look at it again. And now we bring it back to life. And basically what it does, it can um, increase the pressure on, on any kind of skin tissue that you want to measure. But at the same time, uh, it can measure skin blood flow. Um, and you see that on the right, just kind of how it works. So you place it either on the finger or you do it at the angle, both ankle and uh, the knee. And you can manipulate the, the pressure of the skin at the same time. And we've done that. In preparation for, for a, a grant application, we've done it in a few people just to see, okay, can we measure this? Is there something going on? And is this worth pursuing? And these, it's a bit of a, there's a lot of figures here, but these are kind of the, the early results. Uh, and in the right column, they have people with spinal cord injury, and you see the, the numbers, like very low numbers. But, and on the left, you have the able body controls, and we measure finger, knee, and ankle. And if you see, just quickly looking at the peak numbers, but also just scanning the, the, the areas on the curve, there is a, a suggestion that indeed that response might be in, uh, in, in spinal cord injury, especially at the ankle. Um, there's, um, yeah, there's a large reduction in that increase in blood flow uh, in, in spinal cord injury. So we, we thought that was encouraging, and we, we applied them to do the full project. And just uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, we got the, the go ahead from uh, the PVA, the Paralyzed Veterans of America, to do this project. So we'll recruit 16 SCI and 16 AB and a pre visit. So, first, we basically do what we just saw. So, we measure pressure induced pressure relation at a site where people have sensory function, so at the finger, and we do the same at the knee or the ankle. Right? Ankle at this point, there's no sensation in the skin in, uh, in the SCI. Um, and then the second visit, we want to look more closely at the, the effect of that local sensation. So, with capsaicin cream, you can block the, the sensory nerves. Um, and then we measure this again. So, for a few days, we block these nerves, do the, do the measurements, um, and get more information on whether this impairment in SCI is sort of sensory. Mediated or whether it's a long 
local effect. And then thirdly, to look more closely at markets that might be associated with this with this response and potentially the impairment in SCI, we um, do a sort of a well-established test of endothelial function, which is uh, you know, thermal hyperemia. So you place a, a heating pad on, on a part of the skin, and then you look again at skin blood flow. And then the, the larger that response to skin blood flow, the better your endothelial function um, is the, uh, the assumption. And also we take a, a, a suction blister. So basically we can take a little bit of fluid from the skin. So the site where we measure it, so we're really looking at local inflammation. And then we can look at the inflammatory markers like IL-6, even alpha and IL-10. So that's, uh, yeah, that's that's the plan for the coming, coming two years. So. And there's one thing you need to look at, like, is there something affected by spinal cord injury? But obviously the end goal is to then improve this measure, because ultimately we want to help prevent the pressure ulcers. And yeah, two, two therapeutics that, that look promising in that aspect, and that would be a follow-up from the project I just discussed, are, yeah, topical creams, I think. So there's one, uh, rapamycin, that we heard it in the news, it, it becomes just like with the GLP-1 agonist, but it comes a bit of a fact where in a lot of animal studies, they've shown that it can extend lifespan, um, which is also done at San Antonio, actually, they have an intervention testing program where there are three sites where they run these trials in mice, and they are more heterogeneous mice than the normal mice, which is a big advantage of it. And, and they're really independent groups that work on the same RCT in mice in a way at the same time. Um, and they're going to consistently an extended lifespan like the other mice. But more importantly for this is that it also seems to reduce inflammation, cellular senescence, um, and We've got some pilot data in our group where after 10 days it also improves endothelial function. So that will run one candidate. Um, and there's a group in France that looked at alpha lipoic acids more directly in relation to PRP. And they've shown that this administration of, of uh, this antioxidant can improve pressure in these space operation in diabetic mice. So that would be something also to translate. And then, obviously, the, what would be the nicer because it comes with other benefits if, to see if uh, exercise, heat therapy, um, or potentially other supplements can, uh, can do the same. So, yeah, I'll just go back to the slides. How, how do you to measure that in the session? What kind of list? Uh, how do you get a list there in the first place? Yeah, I've never seen it in person, but I've seen videos of the team does it. Um, and you have it's kind of um, a box in a way where you put your arm and they create like a, a vacuum, you know, they, they create a, a, a very large blister. So that kind of bubble that you, that you have or when you have a blister, right? When you know you're doing heal or something. And then you basically stick a needle in a blister and pull out the, the fluid. I need to YouTube it. I can't think. <laughs> how, 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 yeah, how does it go there? No. You have these suction cups, you know, sometimes you see that people with you know, like bruised backs. Yeah. Do you know when you when you have a blister, right? And you get this, it's uh, bubble. When you pinch that, yeah. that fluid comes out. No, no, I can see that. Once well, the blister is there, but how do you create a blister that's just in a vacuum? Yeah. That, I'll, I'll have to see in person, but it gets very hot. And then the, like yeah, the heat injury as well. Yes, it's a bit of a well, it gets hot and then it creates this. I don't think it's a very pleasant position. No, <laughs> it's not, it's not like it. yeah. Um, yeah, that's something you need to also thought like, okay, eventually it would be nice to have a pre and post any intervention, maybe right? Um, but yeah, you don't want to do it too often to uh, <laughs> do any movement. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't, yeah, you can't, you don't get a lot of fluid out of it. And so there's a limit to the number of things. How are you going to measure it then? Do you use like methods where you need very little fluid or? I still, they still do, or they have done it in, in other studies looking at optimizing in older adults, but I've done it with the localizer. That's enough for them.
I'll yeah, I'll see the first and then I'll report it yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's something find out. So. Um yeah, so indeed I, I mentioned exercise and that kind of leads on to more uh, the intervention side and and exercise will be still the first point of call when, when we want to improve in cardiovascular health and then other health markers. And yeah, we know that exercise can help. Like this is work from my master project, for example, where we looked at, uh, we monitored people training for a hand bike event, a mountain time trial, and they trained for four months. As you can see there in the, in the study design, we did a peak test, pre and post that training phase, and we looked at body composition measures and yeah, you can see here that, that that can be effective. So at the top, uh, that's the main one, so peak power output uh, during a period of peak test. And how you can read this is that that line, that diagonal there is is, is the zero, that okay, nothing happens. And the more, the further you are towards the time point two, the better you are improving. So most of the people that are actually improve uh, peak power output. And a similar thing was shown for for basic components. But at the same time, yeah, we also know that's that's not these are very motivated people, and it's not for everybody. Uh, although we have nice guidelines which were developed here uh, in Lafra and the Canadian group. Um, but yeah, there's also more and more voices going up saying, ah, okay, well, there's actually a lot of people that, that can't meet those guidelines, uh, that a lot of barriers to, to get to a gym, uh, physical barriers to actually do the arm country. So maybe it's, it's a good time to, yeah. To think about other um, other interventions or additional, um, and this is where our work, we basically started at Lafra, uh, comes in. So the main focus has been passive feed therapy, uh, but recently we also added uh, remote ischemic ischemic conditioning as well as cold therapy. And I'll yeah I'll focus again on passive feed therapy, but I'll pass on that. And yeah, heat therapy is, is not a new thing itself. Like, you know, the, the Romans, they, they, they did it and they thought it had health benefits. But it's only really, really since the you know, late 1990s that it got a bit of traction in the, in the scientific world. Um, so this little paragraph, and this is basically almost all of the paper that was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, this shows an improvement in fasting measures of glucose metabolism after three weeks of hot therapy. So that kind of sparked an interest amongst other people as well, like, um, yeah, it can be more wiser. And what since has become clear is that like exercise, it seems to target multiple body systems. So it, it might have an effect on, on inflammation. So it's, it's likely to induce that acute inflammatory response that we also see after exercise. That you can see in that in that figure there. So you have an initial IL6 response, which then uh, tends to be followed by a longer lasting, yeah, sort of anti inflammatory response. So the idea is that if you use that response on a regular basis, that might improve the inflammatory response. And at the same time, and that I think the most robust evidence uh, is in that area is how it improves vascular function. And in our study, we show also in acutely that we think increases arterial blood flow, which then um, gives the sheer stress on the vascular system and over time uh, may improve vascular function. So there the gray line is whole body heating. I'll discuss it in more detail later, but the gray line is whole body heating, the, the solid black line is more local heating, and both uh, increase those vascular blood flow. Um, at the same time, it might also impact on glycemic control. This is um, an animal study where they basically induced, uh, they heated uh, rats up once a week, but very hot, <laughs> like sort of sub-lethal uh, temperatures. Um, and they saw their improvements in, in, uh, in glucose tolerance and the specifics of the job are not important. And so yeah, with that background in mind, we, we wanted to look at that here as well in, in able-bodied humans. So we first, we're interested in an acute response to a session of, of heat therapy, in this case, hot water immersion, and I later on also did a chronic heat immersion. So here on the left, you see um, hot water immersion on the right, 
and then a control uh, condition on the left, which was just sit, sitting in a, in a heat control room. And we see that acutely, we can indeed, like your exercise, we can induce that uh, IL 6 response. And what is promising, especially for the rehabilitation setting and, and using it in a more clinical setting, is that that response is also seen in spinal cord injury. Whilst with exercise, it's often sort of hit and miss when you see that IL 6 response. With heating, uh, it appears to be a, a fairly robust uh, response. And then when we then had the same people engaging in a two week heat therapy intervention, we saw, like the, that animal study that I showed before, we saw an improvement in fasting measures of uh, glucose metabolism. So in this case, fasting insulin went down, uh, and the same for fasting glucose um, in comparison with that control group. So that's promising, right? Because acute responses show similar profiles as exercise and chronically we can improve some aspects of metabolic health. But then at the same time, yeah, there, there might still be reasons to not uh, engage in heat therapy and then choose something else. And one of the reasons is the issue of thermal regulation in people with spinal cord injury. And at the top, you see a study by Katie Griggs that basically, yeah, Gave uh, a temperature, core temperature pill to uh, athletes with either parapleach or parapleach, um, and they let them play a, a wheelchair rugby game. And you see that that core temperature rises to, yeah, temperature that you think, ah, oh, well, this might be, uh, might be concerning. And also, when you speak to medical doctors, the first response is always, well, people would actually struggle with thermal regulation, why would you do heat therapy? That's surely that's going to be a, a danger. So that's one reason why maybe you don't want to um, use too intense uh, heat interruptors. And at the same time, at the bottom, in our study, the, the study that I just reported, we see we also ask people how they feel during these sessions. And just a simple questionnaire to see that. And what in the control phase, which you see on the left, people say that uh, neutral doing hot water immersion. There's a lot of variation, but people in general start to feel worse and worse. And at the end, yeah, felt pretty uncomfortable. So maybe think like, okay, maybe we should try to find sort of a balance by not going all out and making people too hot. Um, so finding something more modest, but that still induces the responses that we're after. So still uh, induces that IO6 response. Um, and for example, the increase in blood flow that we see is all that people. And the first attempt we made for this uh, was in this study where we had three conditions. So the first one was sort of the more traditional whole body heating with a lot of two suits. Um, in the middle, we then heated the legs, where we had the large muscle mass that might produce R6, for example. Um, but at the same time, we cooled the upper body. So we got cool uh, one of two suits, but also uh, cooling elements. In, uh, in this shirt that, that uh, we get with that treatment. And then a control uh, condition as well on the other one. And again, these were, these were able bodied um, students, and we looked at IL 6 inflammatory markers. Uh, we did an OTPP an hour after the heating, uh, and we looked at arterial blood flow as well using ultrasound. And first of all, you see, yeah, I need that we, we managed to clamp that core temperature with the, the cooling of the upper body. So the, the gray line is the whole body eating, which is kind of the increase that we saw with all the therapy, so one and a half degree roughly. But then in the lower body eating, we, we managed to clamp that. Keep it fairly similar to the control condition. And then as you might expect from that, sort of the whole body eating is again this people in general feeling worse and worse and worse and feeling, yeah, very bad near the end of that session. Whilst when we cool the upper body, um, the LBH condition, that's very similar to the control. So, and then when we look at IO6, so this is in this case the area on the curve. So that we took a few blood samples throughout the three hours after heating and kind of compiled them. And then we see actually promisingly that there was no difference between the IO6 concentration after lower body heating compared to whole body. So together, that's, that was promising in our eyes. Um, like 
we can improve that perceptual response to leaving and at the same time still have this inflammatory response that we're after. But then there was, um, yeah, and the same for, for, for more large blood flow, that was larger in whole body eating, but still increased in that lower body eating. But it was also more negative news uh, if you looked a bit further. So, for example, we looked at uh, nitric oxide bioavailability um, by, by looking at nitrate concentration. That was only increased after whole body eating. And the same was true for IORA, which is anti inflammatory marker. And the same was true if you look at the glucose response as well as, um, yeah, sort of the whole body. So, some markers might be indeed similar for low body eating, but overall, it seems that. We need a stimulant, a heat stimulant to, uh, to get some of these physiological effects. But we then took that a little bit more applied by going back to our hot body immersion model, uh, this time only till the, till the waist, and then we used a fan to cool the upper body. So we have three conditions again just the traditional hot body immersion, and with a fan and a control condition. And it was an hour long heat. And here you see that although indeed the, the fan condition reduced that increase in core temperature slightly, but overall there was a there was still a larger response than we saw with the cooling with the low body heat in the previous study. Um, so slightly more uh, pronounced things. But then still, when we look at these perceptual responses again with this feeling scale, we see that the classic decrease decrease after whole body immersion. But we managed to keep that fairly stable after that cooling of the, the upper body. And then promisingly, promisingly, again, like with the previous study, that if we look at IL6, there was actually no difference between the fan condition and the hot body emotion. So this might suggest that in this case, it was, was a large project to look at different markets, but in this case, it suggests that, um, yeah, maybe an applied. Um, Modality like this, just using a fan to cool the upper body, might be a way to to make it more comfortable and at the same time induce an effect that you want. And then you can take it one more step further, and that's what uh, Jen Cheng at McMaster did. Is they used this little yeah bucket that you see there at the bottom, um, and they they heated either just the ankle or uh, up to the, the knee, those two conditions. And here they looked again at core temperature. So you see a fairly modest increase in core temperature, right? Like about half a degree Celsius. And then they were mostly interested in passive effect, so flow mediated dilation. This is arterial uh, and the field. And then I so saw there you see the ankle and the knee on the left and a control condition on the right. You see that even modest heating like that, so literally just the ankle, can acutely improve um, FMD in, in healthy, able bodied uh, students. So, yeah, there might be a, a, a role for that more localized heating um, when we want to use that. In, in. Um, and then the next step, you might like, recognize this, this guy, and yeah, most of the work is done by you now, so yeah, thanks for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was nice to work together on this project. So here we looked at sort of two, I guess, mostly used uh, ways of heating. So the dry heat, which can also be done in a sauna, but in this case, we use this uh, individual pot, which yeah, is similar to a sauna, so dry heat, uh, and compare that to, to hot water emotion, what we've used in the, in the past. And what you know did is, she yeah recruited 12 able-bodied students and then had three conditions so one was dry heat in the pots which was yeah for about 70 degrees and then hot water immersion at a temperature that kind of matched the core temperature that we saw in the, the pot and then we also had a control condition where people were sliding in the uh, ambient temperature and you can see there kind of the study design is how the, the heating was an hour we took blood samples pre and post and again, look at those perceptual measures as well, as well as skin. 
And here you see the, the relative temperature changes, and they are fairly similar. Uh, and that was by design. Okay? Um, so between the dry heat and the hot water immersion. But what is different that you can see on the right is the skin temperature. So this is mean skin temperature. And it's actually higher in the dry heat, so the what mainly the sauna, let's say, compared to hot water immersion. And um, yeah, promisingly is, is that the I6 response again is kind of different, but the perceptual responses uh, in hot water immersion versus sauna, they're actually more positive uh, after hot water immersion, potentially unrelated to the lower skin temperature. Uh, at least that's what we thought, and that's what you guys are studying uh, more closely. Um, but there was a similar I6 response between those. Modalities. But together, that, that suggests, although well, that is only a cute study, but it suggests that if we want to, if people struggle a little bit with, with eating and they may be finding a little bit uncomfortable, you may be rather go for hot water immersion compared to so. And then, yeah, still, obviously, the, the next step is to actually then test it in people with spinal cord injury rather than uh, only stick to the, the proof of principle that, we, that we've done, in the, done before. So that is what I'm currently doing at the, the PA in, in San Antonio. So this is the study that, that we're running at the moment. And um, we have first baseline assessments where we look at glucose metabolism. Uh, we again look at uh, this thermal hyperemia, uh, so endothelial function, and we take blood samples for inflammatory markers. And then we have a control phase where people kind of serve as their own controls so for eight weeks. We you know, see them, we go about their daily life. Then we do the same set of, of measures again, and then they engage in an eight week uh, passive heating intervention where yeah, we use the model that we uh, used before. So we use a uh, lot of shoe suits and heating blankets to kind of wrap them up. And um, yeah, they come in three times a week in the lab uh, to, to engage in this, this kind of therapy. And then obviously at the end, we repeat that yeah, um, test that. And and this I realize that this is a, a bit of an anti climax, but this is still going on, and I, I don't have uh, data for that yet. But I uh, hope next summer to to share that. You heat them to the same temperature you heat in the able body. Yeah. So what we do here actually, um, partly because of safety reasons, um, is we rather than going for. A, Set time, that's 60 minutes. We do a, a one degree core temperature increase. Okay. So, for some, that's like the shortest we've had is like 45 minutes, and for some, it's an hour, 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. And then, yeah, go to kind of the other end of the spectrum um, cold therapy. So, this is in or well, led really by uh, Sonia Kroot at the University in, in Amsterdam, who's also based at a rehab center in Amsterdam. And she was basically approached by a physical therapist in the center who was really, who is kind of into more alternative intervention. And he, um, he got acquainted with the Wim Hof method. And maybe some of you have heard of it, uh, um, or the Iceman, maybe that's, that rings a bell. So he is very vocal about encouraging cold therapy and exposing yourself to the cold. And he developed this method where you combine breathing exercises and meditation with uh, daily cold showers. And yeah, this is something that has been tested and later with, uh, at the university in Nijmegen in, in the Netherlands, where they um, looked at people who've done this kind of intervention and then they assess the inflammatory response to, to LPS infusion. And that, that's sounded quite good to me, but um, it's basically inducing artificial inflammation in, in the human body. Um, and then they looked at uh, pro-inflammatory markers in response to that infusion. So you see there in the, the white is the control. So basically are different people that haven't engaged in any kind of cold therapy or framework method. And then on the right, you have the people who have done this method for a while. And you see that, yeah, that, that pro inflammatory response to LPS infusion is, is actually off. Um, which is interesting because I, I think initially it's it's easy to 
put it away as a bit of a path, and obviously we still have to see how it works. But yeah, these are interesting findings, and the same was shown in a, an eight week intervention uh, in people with arthritis, where they showed a reduction in inflammatory markers uh, after three more months. So we now, well, actually conducting a, an RCT into this method, and you can see the, the design here in this figure, where uh, we have three groups and, and all have 20 individuals in those groups, and we have usual care, so basically people go about their normal life. And then in the middle, we have part of the Wim Hof method, so only the breathing exercises and the meditation. And then the third group is the addition of the cold therapy. Cold therapy in this case is uh, cold shower daily and building up from 30 seconds all the way up to five minutes. Um, and then pre and post, we look at the inflammatory markers, blood pressure, um, and pulmonary function as well, and, and metabolic markers. So again, I hope to share that with you next year and provide you with the economic and the um, But I feel like a little bit since we, we've done a pilot study actually uh, on just that uh, part of the remote method, so the breathing exercises and meditation. And then we see if we look at pulmonary function, um, that yeah, people seem to improve their, their pulmonary function, which could be related to uh, pretty detailed breathing exercises. So the, the question is whether the addition of cold therapy actually helps the pulmonary function and that's what's possible. Um, and then lastly, just briefly, is a, a project that uh, Natasha will be starting or has started uh, as looking at remote ischemic conditioning in people with SCI. And David has done all the, the groundwork for this. I'll, I'll skip to that because that's a little bit of time. So the, the figure there in, in the middle is, is David's work where he look at arm cranking exercise capacity um, before or after uh, remote ischemic conditioning versus shen. And remote ischemic conditioning in this case is um, it's done by a blood pressure cuff and you occlude uh, the arm for five minutes, five minutes rest, occlude, and so you have those cycles that induce like a local temporary ischemia. Um, and that's shown to increase physical capacity in clinical, populations um, and now yeah we're kind of assessing and starting a, a project to see whether that is also true for upper body um, exercise capacity and, and some health markers and, and they can show that at least in able-bodied students uh, that it can actually uh, improve exercise capacity. Um, just to conclude um, so at first I spoke about how spinal injury might affect physiology and metabolic health. So we show that indeed diabetes is, is an issue in this population and, and the rates are roughly two to three times higher than in the general population. In the middle, yeah, we've shown that maybe it's not only insulin sensitivity, but also insulin secretion, where we should pay attention to. And on the right, it's need that pressure-induced facial dilation as a risk marker for uh, pressure losses that we might uh, be able to target uh, with specific interventions. And then, yeah, finally, there are options out there for people who don't have the capacity to exercise or experience too many barriers that we can provide alternative or additional interventions also for those people. Um, yeah, I'll have to briefly, I want to thank, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm missing out on many people here, but I want to thank everybody who I've worked with in, in the, the last years. And yeah, just the, the, the main thing to, to thank the, well, again, Peter Harrison said, well, this was the dinner after um, the PhD fight. Uh, and I think that kind of atmosphere and, and, and uh, yeah, sort of friendship that you create here, love with everybody. So 